Okay, welcome back. Uh, the way I'm recording these, something odd might happen when you watch the ones near the end because I'm actually doing them quite, doing them quite a bit early. It's the 28th of March today while I'm recording this one, which will happen closer to the middle of April. So there may be things happening in the world that I'm completely look like I'm completely oblivious to. That's not because I'm stupid, it's because I'm early. I'm actually recording this one for the second time. The first time I did it, uh, I was sleepy, I was yawning. I think I did that once before, and I was just terrible. So I'm going to do this again and try to make it more interesting. All right, here we go. Questions from last time. Number one, what does the notation 1s2, 2s2, 2p3 mean? It's one of these four. So I'll give you a minute. Oh, we should have some light here. Okay. And the answer is, it's nitrogen. It has seven electrons. Uh, two of them down in the bottom state, 1s. Two, two electrons over there on the left side of the periodic table, lithium and beryllium. And then in the 2p uh, states, there are three electrons. And that's what nitrogen looks like. The correct letter order for L equals 0, 1, 2, 3 is which one of these? And that's right. It's SPDF. And you just have to memorize that. Maybe you have from chemistry. The reason that there are 10 3D elements is that how come? All four of these calculations are carefully designed to give you the number 10, but only one of them is the reason that there are 10 3D elements. And the answer is C. In the n equal 3, for n equal 3, which is can have L's of 0, 1, and 2, for the L equal 2 case, <clears throat> the M values can go from minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2. That's five quantum states. And you can put two electrons in each quantum state because in each one you can have spin up and spin down. And so that makes 2 times 5, which is 10. Number four, the reason that the 10 3D elements are not in the n equal 3 row of the periodic table is that it's B. The electrons in the 3D orbitals are crowded together. It raises their energy and pushes them up into the next row. Number five, the far right column in the periodic table consists of atoms whose L shells, what? And you probably read about this or remember from chemistry. Those are elements whose L shells are completely filled with electrons, spin up, spin down. They're happy. They like it. And they're called, right over there, they're called the noble gases. Having every electron orbital full means that they don't want electrons, they don't need electrons, and so they almost don't react chemically at all. All right, nuclear physics. We're going to talk about quantum mechanics and relativity right down at the center of the atom. And uh, E equals mc squared and its uh, cousin m equals e over c squared figure prominently in the physics of the nucleus. Let's take a little review of what matter looks like. Here's a steel beam. If we look at that steel beam a little closer, and brush it a little bit. It looks like this. If you get up closer, it starts to look like this. You start to see the imperfections on the surface, but you can't see the atoms yet, but you can see uh, the stuff that we just can't polish away or don't care to. Then if you get real close, no, that's just a little joke. Okay, so we'll skip that one. And if you go even closer, you start to see the molecular structure. This is a way of imaging surfaces without using light. So this isn't a light image. 
this is what, using something called atomic force microscopy, and you start to see the individual atoms and how they're arranged. And you can see kind of crystal patterns down there, although it doesn't make one big pretty crystal like a diamond. It makes a whole bunch of little jumbled up crystals. If we go down to the atomic level, then we see individual iron atoms, and we can't image those. In this picture, these are the some d orbitals for the iron atom, that's what its valence uh, electrons look like. They're in these kind of states. Um, I just made a little tiny yellow dot show up. Did you see it? I'm going to point to it for you. That little tiny yellow dot there, I'm trying to show you the nucleus, but the, even that dot that you can hardly see, it's 500 times bigger than it should be to be the nucleus. So the nucleus is just incredibly small, a hundred thousand times smaller than the size of these uh, orbitals that you can see here in this picture. If you get down really close to the nucleus, it would look something like this. It looks like a, a bunch of jelly beans all held together by some kind of stickiness. Protons and neutrons are mixed together. This is about what an iron nucleus would look like. If you look at each individual proton and neutron, they're not actually uh, point particles. They have stuff in them. They're called up and down quarks. We'll talk about these right at the end of the semester. And so they even have stuff in them as well. This is crazy. We just went from a distant scale of two meters for the steel beam down to the iron nucleus at two times the minus 15 meters. 15 orders of magnitude to get from that beam down to the nuclei, which give the atoms in the beam uh, their mass. So here's a question for you. Why don't the protons in a nucleus repel each other and blow the nucleus up, making it impossible to have a nucleus in the first place? And the answer is, there is a stronger force than electricity at work here. Not very originally, physicists have named it the strong force, which seems kind of silly, but that's what it's called. It's called the strong force. And it's much stronger than the electrical force over very tiny distances. It's quite different from the electrical force, which falls off like one over R squared. The strong force only works if the two objects are practically touching each other. You move them further apart than that and and uh, electricity will win. And so that's why nuclei have to look like all the protons and neutrons are touching each other. That's the only way the strong force can work. How do neutrons help keep the nucleus from blowing up? As you read, I'm not sure you thought about this, but it's an interesting question. So one answer is that the strong nuclear force is sticky, and the more stickiness there is holding protons together, the better. And so the neutrons help with the stickiness. You have not just protons sticking to each other, but the neutrons help stick the program protons together too. Okay, that's true. Uh, I think maybe an even better reason is that the neutrons space the protons out so that they can't repel each other quite so strongly. The other two answers, not so good. Okay, electrons in atoms inhabit fuzzy standing wave patterns of probability. The same thing is true of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, true or false? That is true. Protons and neutrons do exactly the same thing quantum mechanically in the nucleus that electrons do in the atoms. The force is different, and so they respond to that force in a little different way. But the fuzziness and probability and all that stuff is still there. It also applies in the nucleus. We'll see some examples of that later. <coughs> okay, so here are the basics. We have protons, we have neutrons, and we have electrons. A proton has a positive charge uh, of one electron unit of charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The proton is a spin one half particle, which means it's an antisocial fermion, and it has a mass in atomic mass units of 1.0073. The atomic mass unit is built so that it roughly counts 
protons and neutrons, except for those extra decimal places out there, which turn out to be really important. But the leading uh, figures just tell you what you have. So you have one proton, that's like a one. A neutron is also close to a one, 1.0087 in mass. It has no charge. It's also spin a half, so it's antisocial. The electron uh, has a much smaller mass. Uh, it's charge minus one electron unit. It's spin a half. And we're going to use this uh, today. An atomic mass unit is 1.660539 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So in a nucleus, what happens is the protons repel each other, but the strong nuclear force overcomes this propulsion unless the nucleus gets too big. And what happens if it gets too big is that this short range stickiness that only works between one little nuclear particle and another, that stickiness uh, is just not strong enough to overcome the big uh, electrical repulsion of all of those protons in a large nucleus. And so the uh, nuclei just cease to exist out beyond uranium. We can make them and they last for a while, but they're not stable. They don't stick around. Okay, a question. An atom with one electron in an excited state can drop to the ground state by doing what? Uh, you probably really know this by now. They emit a photon as they go down. And this is an example of a fermion changing its energy state by interacting with a boson, which is what the photon is, to facilitate that change in energy. We'll see other examples of that uh, today. A neutron is quite similar to a proton, but it has a little more mass. I don't know if you noticed that on that slide where the masses were, but the neutron is a little heavier than the proton. Well, if energy is mc squared, that means that the neutron is uh, in a high state of higher energy than the proton. And you read about this. The neutron can actually change into a proton by doing what? By analogy with uh, what electrons in high energy states do. The answer is it emits a weak force boson as it goes down in mass slash energy to become a proton. And that actually happens. If you take a neutron out of the nucleus and just put it out in the air and let it hang there uh, in about in about 10 minutes, it's not certain, but in about 10 minutes, it will turn into a proton. Hopefully this is the atom picture you have in your head, that there are these fluffy electron balls uh, probability balls forming standing waves waves around the tiny hard center of the nucleus and it's the electrons uh, behaving in these uh, fluffy standing wave type ways that makes all of chemistry possible the nucleus picture you should have in your head is that it's a solid mass of little proton and neutron balls which are also fuzzy they're fuzzy balls of probability and they're stuck together by the strong force. That's a uranium nucleus there. All right, <clears throat> there is a nuclear periodic periodic table, just like there's an atomic periodic table. The naming scheme that we use for nuclei is similar to what we use for um, chemical elements. There's a number that's up in front of a letter symbol. That's called A. And A is the number of neutrons plus protons. The number that's down, the Z, that's the charge number. It's the number of protons, which of course then is also the number of electrons in the atom that this is the nucleus of. And then in, in that X spot, you put the chemical name of the element. So for example, carbon-14, which has carbon has six electrons. Carbon-14 has uh, eight, pro, eight neutrons. And so it has 14 neutrons plus protons, and we put the C there to remind ourselves we're talking about carbon. It's redundant. The 6 also tells us we're talking about carbon, but it's become traditional to give these elements names, and so that's how we do it. Protons and neutrons fill energy levels caused by the strong nuclear force. 
It's very similar to the electron energy levels in the atom and actually quite a bit like particles in a spherical box because the, the strong force either holds particles together or it doesn't and it kind of puts the, the particles in the nucleus down in a well that feels kind of like a flat bottom and so it's a lot like particles in a box. The protons and neutrons are spin a half fermions so in a given quantum state you can put two protons and no more but the neutrons are different and so you can put two of them in there too. So for instance in the equivalent uh, on the nuclear level to the 1s quantum state where in an atom you can only have two electrons in the nucleus in that bottom state you could have two protons and two neutrons so four particles in one quantum state. Experiments show that the radius of the nucleus is approximately given by this formula. Its order of magnitude is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 meters and then that's multiplied by the number of protons and neutrons inside the A number raised to the one-third power. If you work out what kind of a density this makes, this is a density of about 2 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic meter. It's an enormous density, completely off the charts compared to any densities that we have uh, for substances on this planet. And that means that atoms are mostly made of nothing. If you call somebody an airhead, that's a compliment. It's mostly a vacuum head. There's nothing there in his head. You might wonder why the radius of the nucleus is proportional to the number of protons and neutrons A raised to the one-third power. So consider A little hard spheres of volume delta V. What would be the radius of the sphere that they make when you stack them together? Well, there's some empty space when you pack spheres together, but still the total volume of the combined sphere ought to be proportional to A. And then I apologize. In the formulas down below, I have a capital N. That capital N should be an A. And when I post these slides, I'll fix that. So the volume, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed, ought to be something like the number of protons and neutrons times the little delta V that each one has. And then if you solve that for R, then you get a bunch of constants and uh, a number of uh, particles N or A raised to the one third power. Okay, uh, just like electrons and atoms are bound and sit down in, a, in an energy well, for instance, the, the electron in the hydrogen atom is down in an electron well, it's 13.6 electron volts deep. Uh, the strong nuclear force also causes the nucleons in the nucleus to be down in a really deep well that they can't get out of. And this strong force holding the particles together is the thing that stabilizes the neutron, which would like to decay into a proton after about 10 minutes. Uh, the strong force stabilizes that neutron so that it doesn't decay. It, it stays, stays a neutron. If you want to know how deep this energy well is, you can use E equals mc squared and then look at the masses of the things that make the nucleus up. The difference in the masses will tell you how deep the energy is. That sounds kind of nebulous, so let's actually do the example. So here's the mass of a proton in kilograms. The top, here's the mass of the neutron in kilograms. And there's the mass of an alpha particle uh, nucleus. The, uh, the helium nucleus is called an alpha particle. And I've taken the two electrons uh, off the helium mass to get the mass of the helium nucleus all by itself. So there's the mass of the helium nucleus right there, 6.6446572 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So let's take the mass of the things that make it up, two protons plus two neutrons. Use those neutron and, and proton masses up there. You get 6.695 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Compare that to the mass of the uh, nucleus, and they're not that close. The things that make it up are heavier than itself. That's kind of odd. Well, the reason is that there's negative energy 
involved in the binding. And so the mass of the nucleus is less than the masses of the things that make it up. If you do the subtraction there, the change the delta M is minus 5.045 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Where did this mass go? Well, it's it's energy. It's the binding energy. And you convert that uh, delta M into energy by multiplying by C squared and then dividing by uh, the conversion factor for electron volts. Those nucleons are bound in there by about 28.3 mega electron volts. That's a million times stronger than the uh, potential well for an electron in the hydrogen atom. So the energies involved in the nucleus are just enormous compared to those in the atom. And then remember, uh, it's the energy differences in atoms that makes all of chemistry possible. So dynamite and uh, forest fires, uh, that's all electron volt type energies. This is a million times more than that. And so you'd expect this to be even more spectacular, and it is. Uh, this is these are the energies involved in things like atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs. And in stars, they all uh, do nuclear burning instead of chemical burning. Whenever you need to do energy calculations in the nucleus, you should use the table of masses at this website right here. This is a really great website. You can look up the masses of almost everything in the universe in this table. If you then supplement it with Wikipedia, like if you wanted to know what the uh, different isotopes of Krypton are like, just use Google uh, Krypton isotopes Wikipedia and it'll give you a whole list. This NIST table only has the ones that stick around for a while in the Wikipedia articles for each element you can find all of the uh, even unstable isotopes that don't live very long. And when you work with these, make sure you keep lots of significant figures or your mass subtractions will be way off. The masses in, in this table are given in terms of U, an atomic mass unit, which again is 1.66054 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. The NIST table, I should warn you, is for atoms. That means the electron masses are in there too. If you want to know the mass of a nucleus, you have to take the, the mass in the NIST table and subtract uh, the masses of all the electrons that it has to get down to the mass of the nucleus. Okay, so here's an example of how you would do this. Let's look at carbon-14. Carbon-14 is used in uh, carbon dating. <coughs> it works for ages like thousands of years, <coughs> tens of thousands of years, and even hundreds of thousands of years. It's a, it's a kind of carbon that has eight neutrons in it, six electrons. And if you wait about 6,000 years, it will spontaneously change into nitrogen-14 by kicking out an electron. What's happened is that one of the protons in that carbon-14 nucleus has decided to change into a neutron. And by ejecting an electron, no, I said that wrong, one of the neutrons in the carbon-14 nucleus has decided to become a proton. And so that neutral neutron becomes a positive proton. That doesn't conserve charge, so it's got to throw some negative charge away. And it does that by ejecting an electron. Uh, something called an anti-electron neutrino also comes out. Um, we're going to skip that for a while, but in a couple of days, we'll talk about neutrinos, and then you'll know what that is. Now, if you're wise in the ways of chemistry, you can see that there's a problem here. There is no net charge on the left, and there's a net minus charge on the right, and that makes no sense. Charge is not conserved. And that's because the way this reaction is written, it's a shorthand for the real thing that involves positive nuclei, and the real thing looks like this. It's a carbon-14 nucleus with six positive charges in it that turns into a nitrogen nucleus with seven positive charges in it plus an electron and now if you check the charges you have plus six on both sides and so charges balance and that's good okay let's find out how much energy is released in this decay 
And we could if we knew the masses of the nuclei. So we go to the NIST table. We find that carbon-14 has a mass, an atomic mass units of 14.003241 U, and nitrogen-14 is 14.003074 U, and the electron in atomic mass units is 0 0.000 five four eight five eight whoa that's so small the electron mass is just ridiculously small compared to those uh, atomic masses who cares well you care because we're going to do subtractions and if you compare the masses of carbon 14 and nitrogen 14 they're very close they're the same <coughs> out to the third decimal place so yeah we care about this tiny electron mass so what we're going to do now is we're going to get the nuclear masses by subtracting six electrons from the carbon-14 mass and by subtracting seven electrons from the nitrogen-14 mass to get these things, 13.99995 and 13.99923. It looks like things have actually gotten worse in terms of them being close together. But nevertheless, we will plow ahead keeping lots of significant figures. And so now we're going to check the before mass, that's the carbon-14, and compare it to the afterward mass, which is the mass of the nitrogen-14 plus an electron. Now, I should be putting the mass of the neutrino in there, but we, the neutrino was thought for a long time to not have mass, and now we think it does have mass, but its mass is um, thousands of times smaller than the electron mass so we're just going to skip it so if you check those masses you and then subtract them you find that the carbon 14 is a little heavier than the products by about by a, a, a mass of 1.71 times 10 to the minus 4 atomic mass units we're going to convert this to energy now by using delta mc squared it's 2.56 times 10 to the minus 14 joules. Convert that to electron volts by dividing by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and you get 160 kilo electron volts. And if you look up this decay on Wikipedia, it gives 160 keV. So we did this right. Now, this is tedious, but this is what you have to do. And you have at least one homework problem where you have to do this. So keep lots of significant figures and be careful. Take the initial, the mass of the initial stuff and subtract the mass of the final stuff from it. You'll get a difference in mass, which you can then convert into energy this way to get the right answer for the energy that comes out of the reaction. Okay, now you're thinking, why didn't we do, <coughs> why didn't we do this for electrons in the atom? In the atom, you start with an excited state, which should be heavier because it has more energy. And then it drops down to the lower mass, lower energy, ground state. Shouldn't we have done this for atoms? Well, yeah, we, we probably really should have. But the problem is that with those low energies in the the low energies in the atom compared to the nucleus, the mass differences are out in the eighth decimal place. I think that's not even true. I think it's more like the, let's see, four, more like the 12th decimal place or something. And we can't make mass measurements that accurately. So we don't do it this way for atoms, only for nuclei. Okay, we need to talk about isotopes. An element is named for how many electrons and protons it has. The electrons determine the chemistry of the element, and that's how, why it has the name that it has, is because of chemistry. But if you keep the proton number the same and change the number of neutrons, all you've done is change something down in that tiny nucleus, 100,000 times smaller than the atom. The chemistry will be unchanged. The chemistry pretty much doesn't care what you have down there. These extra neutron, or maybe fewer neutron, cousins of an element are called isotopes. And so now we should cue the baseball team on The Simpsons. And if you want, you can take a break. Go look up The Simpsons isotopes on YouTube. The mascot Homer um, clip is a really good one. 
and then come back and we'll talk about isotopes some more. Neutrons help keep the nucleus stable, keeping it from decaying into another kind of nucleus. But you can have too little or too much of a good thing. If the nucleus number, if the neutron number is too small, so that you have too many protons, then electrical repulsion is going to blow the nucleus up, or more likely allow the nucleus to go to a lower energy state by changing a proton into a neutron. That's called beta plus decay. Or you might have too many neutrons. And then what happens is that the neutrons decay into protons. That's called beta minus decay to go to a lower nuclear energy energy state. And that changes the chemical name again. So for Goldilocks nuclei, the ones that are just right, they have nearly equal numbers of protons and neutrons at the bottom end of the periodic table. And when you get up to the heavy elements, it, you need more neutrons to stabilize the nucleus. And so I guess they'd be at more like 1.6 times more neutrons than protons in the heavy elements. And here's an example. This is mercury down here. These uh, all have 80 at the bottom. They're all mercury. If you did experiments on these things, to see what chemical they are, they're all mercury. They do exactly what mercury does. But their masses are different. These masses differ from 196 nucleons up to 204. The most stable one is probably right in the middle, around 200. Uh, you'll notice that some numbers are missing. A lot of the odd numbers are missing. How come they're missing? They're missing because they're radioactive. They decay away and you can't find these in nature. But all of these isotopes can be found in nature because they hang around for a really long time. All right, I mentioned radioactive decay. We better talk about radioactive decay. So radioactive decay is dangerous. And here's how it works. Radioactive decay is always involves nuclei dropping to lower energy, which means lower mass states, by emitting radioactive particles. And there's several kinds of, of a radioactive decay. In beta minus decay, a neutron in the nucleus turns itself into a proton, kicks out an electron um, to conserve charge, and an anti-electron neutrino. This makes the proton number go up by one, so Z goes up by one, and A stays the same because it just counts protons and neutrons. So that's what happens when there's too many neutrons. An example of this is tritium. Uh, this is a form of heavy hydrogen. It has a proton, that's the one, and two neutrons plus one makes three for the, the A up in the top. We give it a, a T because we call it tritium, but you could just, you could put an H there as well because it's an isotope of hydrogen. That will spontaneously decay to helium-3 plus an electron and kick out an anti-electron neutrino. Then we have beta plus decay. This happens when you don't have enough neutrons. The atom can go to a lower energy state by building neutrons out of protons. And so what it does is it takes a proton and turns it into a neutron, which sounds crazy because the neutron used to have positive charge and now there's no positive charge in there. Well, what it does is it kicks out a positron. The positron is that little E plus thing down there. And it kicks out an electron neutrino. The Z goes down by one because you've lost a proton. Positron. Well, okay. What's a positron? A positron is the antiparticle of the electron. And we'll talk about antiparticles uh, when we get to day 40. The positron has the same mass as an electron. In fact, and it's spin a half, and it behaves just like an electron, except that it's positive instead of negative. Nuclei, another way nuclei can drop to lower energy states by emitting radioactive particles is that they can kick out an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a fully intact helium-4 nucleus. The helium-4 nucleus, two protons, two neutrons, is just magically stable. It's a combination of nucleons that just really like to be together. And when you kick out a helium-4 nucleus, it causes the Z number, the proton count, to go down by two. And the A drops by four because two, two neutrons went out there too. And this is what happens when there are too many nucleons in the nucleus. When you get up in the high end of the periodic table, 
the nuclear energy well that holds all these particles together is starting to get almost full, almost as full as it can possibly get. And if you put very many more in there, you get up in the range of, of nuclei that just don't hang together at all, and they just they just are radioactive, or that you just can't make them; they won't form. An example of this is americium-241. It kicks out an alpha particle to become neptunium-237. You'll notice that the Z went down by two from 95 to 93. The A went down from 241 to 237, down by four and the helium nucleus comes out. You have this radioactive isotope almost certainly in your smoke detector in your apartment or in your house. Then we can have gamma decay. Now this is something familiar. Gamma decay is just like a, a, an atom emitting a photon. Nuclei can be in excited states too. You can have neutrons and protons or combinations of neutrons and protons up at higher energy levels above their ground state and they want to come down to the ground state. And when they do, they emit a photon. Because of the energy energies involved, these are not EV-sized photons. These are million electron volt photons called gamma rays. You don't want to encounter these very often because they do damage to your cells. But they work great in uh, smoke detectors. And in fact, in that decay I showed you, where the americium emits an alpha and drops down to neptunium-237. The thing it drops down to is actually an excited state of neptunium-237, neptunium and that's what the star means. And that has, when that settles to the ground state, it emits a gamma ray. So that thing up in your smoke detector is a little dangerous. It's been uh, shielded enough, but don't take it apart and horse around with it, and don't swallow the parts, please. These radioactivity types, alpha, beta, and gamma, they were given those names way back at the beginning when they were first discovered and nobody knew what they were. They just knew that these were effects. ABC is what it is in English. Alpha, beta, gamma is what it is in Greek, the first three letters of the Greek alphabet. It's a quantum mechanical, that is to say random <clears throat> process. <coughs> we can't say when exactly it will happen. But if you've got lots of nuclei, like 10 to the 25 nuclei or something, a mole of nuclei, uh, then they kind of average out and you can actually write down mathematical equations that tell you what's happening. And this is the mathematical equation. It says if you have a radioactive particle and you've got a bunch of them, then if n is the number of radioactive nuclei that you have, the time rate of change, dndt, of this number is equal to minus a number, lambda, called the decay constant, and it's units of one over seconds, times the number of particles in the, that you have. So the rate at which, okay, sorry, kids, what are you gonna do? Okay, so the rate of change of the number of particles that you have in, a, in this sample is equal to minus lambda times the number that are already there. Now I'd like you to go to YouTube now and look up a Geiger counter sound. It's only a little 23 second click clip. And if you listen to it, you'll notice that the decays are not regular. It'll go click, 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 click. There's a lot of randomness in how often you get a click. And in order to do mathematics with it, you have to average over pretty long times. Each of those clicks that you're hearing in there is a radioactive decay that was detected. And we're going to do math to describe it, but it's approximate math. It's average math. It's not telling you exactly what happens at every second in time. To see why the number that decay per second is proportional to how many are already there, you can do this fun experiment. Now you could do this yourself. You get a cup and you fill it full of pennies and then you shake the pennies out on a table and you remove all the heads and count how many you have left. You started at 100 and maybe you only have 58 left. Then you put those 58 back in the cup, shake it up, pour them out on the table and remove all the heads. And you'll get an exponential decay curve. 
roughly. It'll be bouncy because 100 isn't big enough to make it really work right according to the mathematics, but it'll be close. And the formula that solves that equation for how uh, the number that you have goes down is that it's the number you start with, n of 0, times e to the minus lambda t. That differential equation on the previous page is the very first differential equation you will solve when you start, when you take a differential equations class. Because we know how it behaves in time now, we could ask the question, well, how long does it take for half of it to go away? The time for half of it to go away is called the half-life, and it's related to lambda, and you can easily find it from that equation there in the middle with the e to the minus lambda t, and you just set e to the minus lambda t equal to a half, solve for the time, and you get that the half-life is log 2 divided by lambda. And that works the other way around too. Lambda is equal to log 2 over t to the 1 half. And you'll use both of these when you do the homework. So here's an example of this. Let's do radiocarbon dating, carbon-14 dating. The way this works is that cosmic rays are constantly coming in, <coughs> hitting nitrogen nuclei in the upper atmosphere. And that makes... Uh, carbon-14. This carbon-14 then uh, percolates down through the atmosphere, gets mixed up by all the weather that we have on the planet, and gets incorporated with normal chemical carbon because chemically it's exactly the same as normal carbon. And so animals eat it, plants incorporate it into their bodies, and living things take it in and they put it out and they take it in and they put it out. And so there's a steady state ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, which is the ordinary form of carbon. But when something dies, they don't eat anymore. They don't take anything in or put anything out. They're just stuck with the way they were when they died. And what happens is the carbon-14 in their dead cells starts to decay, and the half-life is 5,730 years. So here's what you can do. If you knew what the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 was back when that thing died, and if you now know, say you pick up an old bone or something, and you measure the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio in this old bone, then that's what it is now. And what it was in the beginning is that F14 over F12 zero thing in this equation times e to the minus lambda t if you know the two ratios, then you can solve for t. Now, you have to be careful because this starting ratio has varied some over the past many thousands of years. But scientists have done uh, tests where they use other methods like tree rings and things to figure out <coughs> how old something is. And you can figure out, if you know how something is, you can go backwards and figure out what the ratio was in the past. And so there are tables of this that have been worked on. And so you can you can find out how old something is. So here's an example. Suppose that the carbon-14 to carbon-12 ratio in ancient Egypt was 1.5 times 10 to the minus 12. And we have some, take a piece of wood from King Tut's coffin, and we measure this ratio, and it's 1.0009 times 10 to the minus 12. Then we ask, how old is the wood? Well, the half-life is 5,730 years. So we find lambda by using log 2 over t to the 1 half. It gives a lambda of 1.21 times 10 to the minus 4 per year. And then we take the rate, use that equation, uh, find that the ratio of what it is now to what it used to be is e to the minus lambda t, which is the 1.0009 divided by 1.5. That's where the 0.667 comes from down below. You take the log of both sides, so you take the log of the 0.667, um, divide by minus lambda, and you can find the time. And if you do that, you find the time is 3,340 years. Now, you need a good measurement to make this work. So at 1.0009, it's 3,344 years. And if it's 1.001, .001, which is awfully close, is still 3344 years. But if you only, if it were 1.01, .01, like if you messed that second decimal place up, now you get 3270. And if you mess the first decimal place up, you get 2560. So you have to measure these things at the 10 to the minus 12 level. 
Now, fortunately, that's relatively easy because in this decay, a nucleus pops right up and says, hey, I'm here, watch me. I'm shooting out a radioactive electron. I'm shooting out an electron because I'm radioactive. So you can see very tiny things. But if you go too far in the past, there isn't enough left to measure and uh, it just isn't very accurate anyway. Okay, so here's some examples of things that are radioactive. Plutonium-238 is an alpha emitter. It has a half-life of 88 years. It turns into uranium-234. And this is the thing that's used in the RTG in the Martian, the thing that's really hot and that he's not supposed to mess with. Uh, that's got some of this plutonium in it and the alpha particles come out with enough energy to get it really hot and things that are really hot can make electricity. There's carbon-14, that's a beta minus emitter with a 5,730 5, year half-life, radio carbon dating uses that. There's carbon-11, which is a beta plus emitter. It has a 20 minute half-life and this is used for medical scanning. They use the gamma rays that are emitted when positrons uh, annihilate with the uh, anti, anti-electrons or the positron annihilate with electrons, you can detect those gamma rays that come out. And this is called a PET scan. Notice the 20 minute half-life. This is a little tricky. Every hospital in the world isn't gonna have a bunch of carbon 11 because uh, very many 20 minute periods, it's all gone, decayed away. These are only medical centers that are very close to nuclear reactors where they can make carbon 12, hustle it over to the hospital <coughs> and do the test. All right, here are some questions for next time. And I will see you then.